Okay. Right. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Adrian Boyer, and I used to be an academic before I retired at the University of Bath. And the principal open source activity that I was and still am involved in is a thing called the RepRap project. Uh, RepRap is short for Replicating Rapid Prototyper. It's a 3D printer that prints a significant fraction of its own parts, and it's an open source machine. So if you've got a 3D printer, you can use it to make another 3D printer. Uh, and that's a project that I started at around, in, uh, well, I initially had the idea in February 2004, so 16, 17 years ago now. Um, and we ran that as a university project. Uh, but it wasn't just a university project because it was open source. We had lots of contributors from all over the world. Uh, I was nominally in charge with the emphasis on the word nominally because simply because it was my idea. And so uh, I had to make some decisions as, as the project progressed. But the principal decision I made at the beginning was that I really didn't want to make very many decisions. Um, and in particular, uh, I explicitly said that I didn't want to direct the project. In other words, uh, because we had, well, at the beginning of the project, perhaps 20 active members of it, though that's grown considerably since, um, I didn't want to say uh, to those 20 people what to do. Um, equally, I didn't want any of them telling the others what to do either. I just wanted to see the project, as it were, drift in whatever direction it chose to drift by some sort of consensus emerging. Um, and slightly to my surprise, this decision uh, didn't lead to a lot of arguments about decisions, uh, which was quite a useful uh, byproduct, which I hadn't fully expected. Um, and what tended to happen was this. Um, we were developing a piece of engineering uh, at three levels. There was software, there was electronics, and there was mechanics. And all of those things needed to be designed, to be written, documentation needed to be written as well and so on and people took a greater or a lesser share of doing that but we weren't just creating one device because it fairly quickly became apparent that people wanted to take the project in different directions um, and so for example we had more than one piece of software written for the project that allowed it to work um, and we had many different both electronic and mechanical designs for the machine. And every time somebody said, no, I think we should do this, uh, the non-decision that I made was, uh, well, other people may not want to do that, but yes, go ahead and do it if you want, of course, and it'll be part of the project. And so uh, people went away and designed different forms of machines, as I say, wrote different pieces of software to essentially to perform the same function. Um, and design different pieces of electronics, again, to perform the same function. And so really uh, what we ended up with when things settled down was a large number of different designs that had been instigated by different members of the project who had taken it off in slightly different directions. But of course, this wasn't like a branching tree in that the branches converged again and you'd find two separate designs. Um, somebody would make a third design, which was integrating with best principles from the two original separate designs. So it wasn't just continually bifurcating, it was coming back together as well. Then people started to, to synthesize the, the, the things that had been made into subsequent and better machines. Um, so to come back to decisions again, um, <laughs> what tended to happen occasionally is that we did get disputes, um, not so much disputes about the design of the machine and how that, that progressed, but uh, more, shall we say, political disputes about, for example, whether we should carry advertising on the project website in order to pay for the project, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, my role in those disputes was largely to arbitrate and if no consensus was reached in a reasonable time when a decision had to be made, occasionally I found myself imposing a decision um, simply as a result of the fact that we've got to decide something, let's decide. Um, and um, 
the 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 uh, the reason I did that was 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 is, or rather the reason I could do that was not because um, there was any hierarchical structure of the project with me at the top. It was simply as the instigator of the project, people were prepared almost all the time. In fact, I can't think of an exception. People were prepared um, uh, to simply take my word as a way of resolving things that had uh, come up as, as differences of opinion. So um, to summarize what I've just said, I really didn't make any decisions about the engineering aspects of the project at all, except for those engineering bits and pieces of the project that I myself was doing. And it has to be said also my research student was doing because obviously he and I were collaborating even more closely than people who were geographically distant. So um, I took decisions on that aspect of the engineering. Many other people took many other and many different decisions on the same engineering taking in different directions. Um, and I was reduced to a sort of elderly and I like to think beneficent, but I don't know if I really was considered as such judge sitting over the whole thing, trying to be impartial uh, when people got into arguments with each other and something needed to be done about that. So that describes how the decision-making process in the project went. It wasn't a democracy particularly. In other words, we didn't, uh, we, we did occasionally have votes on things, um, but it wasn't necessarily that the majority was always uh, uh, considered to be the one way to go. As I say, quite often there'd be a majority and a minority and both would do what they wanted to do, um, in which when you think about it, it actually means the vote was rather redundant. Um, and so um, uh, it progressed in that sort of stumbling and halting fashion. Uh, but nonetheless, we made a machine and it worked. Uh, and that machine is now the basis of the vast majority of the current contemporary 3D printing industry. Um, and so I guess, again, to summarize, uh, I decided at the beginning that I wanted to make as few decisions as possible, and I tried to stick to that all the way through. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's really what I want to say. Nika. Yeah, that's a little bit like a quote from the chapter of David's book, um, Democracy Project, uh, about consensus that uh, we read together in our reading group uh, Friday before that. And yes. he was saying there that uh, actually you have to try to make decisions by consensus as less as possible because everybody should go and be able to do whatever they want by themselves. And the consensus is only required when um, when some some kind of really important and practical events happening like for example yeah exterior like yeah, uh, exactly right not necessarily important i mean take the example i gave five minutes ago which was that whether we should carry advertising on, on the website now the implicit uh, constraint that we were under there is that the project should have only one website clearly if we allowed the website to bifurcate and that there were several different websites, then somebody could have advertising on theirs and somebody else could not have advertising on theirs. Um, but that the necessity for a decision there was actually nothing to do with the nature of the decision itself. It was to do with the uh, practical and political consideration that we only wanted one website. So there had to be a decision made about advertise or not advertise. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, uh, and, and I don't consider that to be a very important decision. It certainly didn't affect the, the progress of the project very much in one way or another. Um, it did give us a few funds when we went with advertising to allow us to pay for people to attend conferences and things, which was quite useful. But that, that, that was, um, yeah, sorry. Anyway, I'll shut up. Yeah, I think it's a very important decision about uh, how many websites uh, should exist, especially in technology, if I understand it correctly. Um, because the very idea of open source for me, and correct me if I'm wrong, is if the projects die, if it's not, uh, if people don't keep going with the development, then somebody else can pick it up and uh, continue. 
but uh, yeah. if you develop in some piece of software and you do have a vision you have to have a control over production it's like you know many mm -hmm. developers come in in this in developing the same website that is very simple technology also it would be probably broken very quickly yes. so in this and case course, you have to have control yeah yes though so, i mean if we look at where rep rap is now in terms of the engineering there are lots of open source designs out there um, uh, most of those designs are described briefly on the web website, but the majority of the actual data that people might want is in their own GitHub repositories. So um, I, it, the website, in a sense, has split. And of course, the same thing happens all over. I mean, uh, if you look at, uh, take Linux, for example, I'm, I'm sure that the Ubuntu website gets far more visitors than Linux.org does, um, because uh, in a sense, it's more useful, if you see what I mean. Similarly, as far as RepRap is concerned, people will go to the RepRap website, perhaps, but if they actually want a design, what they'll do is find the most popular design or the one they want to build, and they'll get that from whoever designed it or the group who designed its GitHub repository, which is not part of the RepRap website. So, you know. So basically, you have the a kind of a core not group but place and then you have many groups who is doing who's implementing yeah. whatever ideas are put together yeah. in this place yeah. yeah yes and and again uh the fact that people have their own github repositories was not a decision that anybody except they themselves made um it uh, that just turned out to be the most convenient way to do it and so it just it fell into that pattern um uh, that didn't involve decision at all in, in a collective sense. And if I come back to your statement that you keep repeating that you try to design the social situation in which you will be, you will have to make as less decisions as possible. Can you yeah. elaborate on that? Because so we, we were talking about place, not even the project where like a central information happening, the idea developing, but then many people doing their own projects somewhere outside, you are not controlling them. So can we talk about not making decision in the central place? Yes. Um, why did I decide that I didn't want to make decisions and I wanted the project to move in whatever direction uh, it evolved? Uh, the answer was because of my primary motivation for carrying out the project, which was not not so much to make it work, though obviously I wanted to do that, but to find out if it could work and to find out how it would work best uh, if left to its own devices. In other words, I was more driven by curiosity to see where it would go than to try and drive it to a particular location. Um, and so I decided to make as few decisions as possible in order to prevent me from driving the project as much as I possibly could, because I wanted to see where it would go on its own. Um, uh, it's, uh, if we imagine a world in which we've got self-driving cars, it's as if one got into the car and said, take me somewhere interesting rather than take me to London. Um, and um, so uh, that, that, was, uh, that was really what, what my motivation was there. Uh, was it any conflict between you being the actually an engineer and trying to develop your own part of RepRap and you being kind of founder of the idea. Is it how, how, how these two roles worked with each other? There might have been, but for the fact that other people could do, do different engineering to achieve the same or similar results. I was developing my own designs with my student and of course we all contributed bits of the design to each other all the time, even if we were designing slightly different machines, the, the people who were involved in the project. And um, it, there wasn't really very much of a conflict simply because I was doing what I wanted to do, but in making the decisions that I was making, I wasn't constraining anybody else. So um, again, I was making decisions in, in the sense that I decided to use, um, you know, uh, M4 screws for, to hold these things together or whatever it might be. Um, but um, that decision was a decision that didn't impinge upon anybody else. Um, 
the other people on the project were free to take that decision up if they wanted to or indeed to change it for their own work so um it uh it, it, lots of decisions of the type the engineering type that you you asked your question about were made by me and by everybody else on the project but they weren't really decisions in the sense that decisions constrain what other people can do um, and I think that's perhaps an important distinction to make in any project that when we say decision um, the word it actually has two entirely different meanings uh, there, there are many words which need more than one word actually because they have so many different meanings and decision is one of them um, you, you can make a decision entirely on your own behalf that decides what you want to do and that doesn't really affect anybody else very much at all or you can be making decisions for groups of people and those are two very 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 different things it seems to me um, both are necessary in many circumstances um, but uh, the, the latter are, are of course much more need much more careful thought and careful approach than the former um, but uh, yeah Rob do you want to ask the question yeah certainly um, I, very interesting and particularly what you're saying on the last bit there about individuals making questions and groups making questions but my question that I wanted to ask you is different Adrian um, it strikes me as when you get groups coming together like this very often the tensions arrive when money gets involved and I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the financing, the overall financing of RIPRAP, and also when you're talking about the smaller groups and, and how they break down and they become um, focused task-based groups, were they financially independent and uh, from the main project and how, how if they were, for, uh, I'm, I'm prejudging the answer to my, the, the question, if they were financially independent, how did they make their decisions and was there tension in those sorts of areas? Um, uh, the answer to your question, how the project was financed, um, the, the bit of it that was done by me and my student at the university had a research grant from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Um, it was a grant for £20,000, actually, sorry, that's wrong, £21,000, I beg your, beg your pardon, uh, which is the smallest research grant I'd ever received in my entire academic career. It's tiny. And I deliberately asked for it to be very small because I wanted to show the project could be achieved with very little expenditure of money. And in oh. particular, uh, the sum I chose was half the cost of a single cheapest 3D printer at the time. In other words, I wanted to show that the entire project could be run for half the cost of a single machine that you could go out and buy on the date when I started, if you see what I mean. So... That, that was my motivation in asking for a small sum of money. And plus I knew, well, rather I didn't know until we'd done it, but I was fairly confident that we could do it for a small sum of money. But that just paid for uh, my research student and the materials that uh, he and I were using. All the other volunteers all over the world, by and large, uh, paid for and bought their own materials out of their own what we might call hobby budget. Um, and the great thing here is that we're only talking about, you know, £20, £30, that sort of thing. Um, we're not talking about people needing, even though we had £21,000, uh, in order to build the bits and pieces of an individual machine, the total expenditure was probably £300 or something like that, which of course is ah, it's a significant sum of money, but it's not the sort of sum of money that a person in the first world would probably be too worried about. Um, so, um, as far as financing is concerned, everybody funded their own stuff, and I'll come to a small exception in a moment, everybody funded their own stuff, uh, and we at the university, my student and I, had a grant to, to, to help. Now, uh, sorry, there were two exceptions. One exception was, we were actually at the beginning the only people who had a real 3D printer, because we had the university's expensive 3D printer to work with. Uh, obviously, we needed a 3D printer to bootstrap the whole idea um, and one of the things we used to do and we thought this was a perfectly legitimate way to spend our grant money was we would print things for other people on the project elsewhere in the world and post those parts to them so basically they'd send us a file we'd print a thing and we'd post the thing off to them wherever they were, New Zealand Denmark whatever um, and 
Uh, that was one sort of expenditure that we made on the behalf of everybody else. Uh, the other thing was the goes back to the advertising decision I mentioned. Uh, we did have advertising income because we ran Google ads on the website, and we used that income basically to to we had a group of uh, a subgroup of the researchers who were entrusted with the advertising income, and we would award money to people on the project who needed it when they couldn't afford bits and pieces themselves. Uh, for example, there was a, a, a bloke in Canada who designed a part of the machine, and he wanted to go to a conference in Washington to present the whole project and also his particular design at a conference on the law and open source work. And he didn't have the money to go to that conference. So we, uh, we decided to give him his airfare, basically. Um, and uh, so that sort of thing was uh, the way we distributed money around. Um, but the sums involved were not large. Um, I think the total advertising income over the entire duration of the project was probably just about equivalent to the grant that we got at the beginning, in other words, £21,000 plus another £21,000 spread over a good 10 or more years. Do, do you know if people were taking advantage of other sources of income indirectly? So, for example, perhaps they were using premises at other universities where they were or they were using equipment with other universities which they were able to use and they didn't have to pay for? The vast majority of them were working in their own garages. They were one of the people at university institutions who were doing things in their university labs. So yes, they were obviously, I mean, they had heat and light provided by the universities and nothing else. Um, and so, uh, yes, a few people were doing, as, as you say, the vast majority of people were um, doing things in their own garages. Once we got things working, which took about three years, people had another stream of income, which was that they would print parts for these machines for other people and sell them on eBay. So, sorry, excuse me, I'm going to cough, I beg your pardon. <coughs> sorry. So once the project was actually functioning and people had their own machine, they could use their machine as a source of income, not an enormous amount of income, but a little bit of income uh, to, to keep things ticking over for themselves. Last one from me uh, before I pass over, but um, you, you personally, is, is this been a unique experience in your professional life or have you done other things like this? I've never run an open source project before I started this one. Um, I had used a great deal of open source software before I started the project. Uh, indeed, the RepRap project was one of the very first open source hardware projects in the world. Uh, so uh, at the beginning, I was going to conferences and meeting opposition from software people who were saying things like uh, open source software licenses are not for hardware, they're for, they're, for, they're for ones and zeros. And I had to point out to them that these days hardware is ones and zeros in the form of a digital design uh, for every part of the machine. Every part of the machine is ones and zeros. Uh, it's just files on a computer. That's all you need in order to make it. Um, so um, yes, uh, it's, it did lead to to that sort of uh, sort of thing, uh, but but uh, you know uh, the the uh, the the main the main uh, movement of the project uh, was was decided by people uh, making their own decisions, not by me making decisions. Mm, thank you. Yes. Uh, no, no, thanks so much, Adrian. This was just great to learn. Um, hi. So um, I think one question I had was just around, um, you know, as as your project grew, uh, you know, like different types of people must have started adopting RepRap and 3D printing, right? And the uses they might have put RepRap to uh, would have been quite different. So uh, I'm thinking like whether, like, you know, there are cases when people were using RepRap in a way that Perhaps you or like the early adopters of RepRap uh, possibly didn't agree with or hadn't foreseen. And yeah. if there are any concerns like that, like, you know, how you address those, you know? Um, yes. Uh, the first uh, instance of that that you described was when someone designed a, a knuckle duster and printed it in the machine uh, for fighting. And so you, you know what a knuckle duster is? No, I don't actually. 
Oh, okay. It's uh, it's uh, a hard. Uh, usually, they're made of metal. It's a hard object that fits over your fingers and is held in the palm of your hand and allows you to punch someone and injure them much more than you could with just your hand alone. Um, and that was the first weapon that was ever made in a rep rap machine. Um, and unsurprisingly, most of us on the project didn't really approve of this. So one of the things that had been established by then was we had a, a separate website. I said that we wanted the project on a single website, but in fact, we'd established a separate website of designs that people could download. And the reason why that was separate was because it wasn't just for RepRap, it was for designs for anything, for different machines that weren't 3D printers and so on. So it wasn't exclusively a RepRap website. Anyway, uh, this knuckle duster design was uploaded to that website, uh, which provoked a discussion uh, and the guy who was running that website, who was a member of the project, but um, uh, was also, also had friends who were nothing to do with the project and they, they ran that website. Um, and they then had a discussion about whether they were going to allow weapon designs on the site. And, and they decided with no input from me, um, sorry, I'm pausing there just to remember. I, I think maybe a few emails may have been exchanged where I basically said that I don't think this is a very good idea. Um, and, and they decided, but I certainly didn't vote on it. I merely expressed an opinion. Um, they voted not to have weapons designs on the site. Um, and then there was a subsequent decision that was made about, about sex toys. Um, one of the debates was about whether they should allow designs for sex toys on the site. Um, I was entirely happy with that, but they pointed out that they wanted the site to be used a lot in schools and by children. And they thought that the site would not actually um, be allowed in schools if they allowed sex toys to be uh, designs to be uploaded to the site. So in fact, they decided to stop those as well, not for any moral objection to the sex toys, but simply so that they could make sure the site was uh, available to school children. Um, and so uh, that, that, that was the, the second instance, I think, of this sort of thing. Wow, that's such an important anthropological uh, research you guys made about <laughs> like <laughs> the thing in the world, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. And uh, I just had one quick follow-up question um, yeah. as well. I think similar. So I think one note is um, th there is this um, Indonesian collective. I was trying to find the link just now who run these uh, workshops so you can three D print sex toys because uh, it's banned in Indonesia, right? Uh, oh, I but, see. I yeah, so it's like a way to circumvent those sorts of bands, you know. Um, but my second question was around decision making, you know, Adrian. So you said, um, you know, how like uh, you wanted to make it such that people can take rap rap and sort of do their own thing with it. And that's where like the decision making, or, like that's where consensus and democratic processes can work. Whereas like at the sort of, uh, at a different level, uh, or like when you're sort of setting up the website and so on, you like it wasn't essential, I guess, like decision making. So uh, I was curious, like, are we talking about two different levels, you know, uh, where, you know, like one level is just like what rep rap is, is being decided. And then the second level is where like the democratic ways in which rep rap gets applied for in various ways takes place, mm -hmm. you know, that be a fair way to see it. Well, early on, we recognized that that second level of yours, how the machine gets applied, was because it's self-replicating that's something uh, which literally we had no control over whatsoever we could express opinions about how it was used um, but there's a, an enormous difference between expressing an opinion and having control um, and as soon as you've got a machine that copies itself um, it, you can't constrain what people do with it. Um, it it's like a marijuana plant and producing marijuana seeds. Um, once you've got a plant that makes seeds, you can't stop, <laughs> you can't say, right, well, this is the last one that's ever going to be grown. Uh, it will never, that, that will never happen. Um, and so um, you, um, uh, you have those, as you say, there are two levels. And, and in particular, at the higher level, uh, where you're concerned that the use of the machine may be, um, antisocial in some way or, or generally disadvantageous to some group or whatever it might be, 
uh, you simply have to accept the fact that some people are going to take it in that direction and there's nothing you can do about it except express disapproval. Um, uh, it's, it's a question of controllability. Um, some, some technologies are very, very controllable. Um, uh, an obvious example is, uh, well, I, I've used this example before, I, I don't, can't quite remember if I've, I've talked to, to you about it, but um, uh, take nuclear power as an example of a technology. Nuclear power is really controllable, and the reason it's really controllable is because it's big, and it requires enormous sums of money, and it requires a large amount of land, and it requires supplies of cooling water and all sorts of things. In other words, if you want to build a nuclear power station, there are all sorts of ways in which authorities in general can constrain what you do or possibly even stop you doing what you want to do. Um, so that's one end of the controllability scale. Uh, the other end is something like genetic engineering. Um, pretty much anybody who's prepared to learn a little bit of how the technology works can do their own genetic engineering in their own kitchen. And if you want to make a plant glow in the dark, you can do it with equipment that you can make yourself. And so genetic engineering is at the absolute opposite end. It's almost completely uncontrollable. And if you've got a very uncontrollable technology, um, authorities in general can pass laws until they're blue in the face. It won't have very much impact on what gets done. Um, but equally, if you've got a technology that's very controllable, um, then, uh, then it's fairly easy for authorities to constrain what happens with it. I mean, and sometimes technologies transition. Uh, a good example is, um, is motor cars and speeding on roads. Um, it used to be the fact that it was almost impossible in the vast majority of people, in the cases, to stop people from exceeding the speed limit. Um, simply, there weren't enough policemen. Uh, but then the automatic radar speed camera was developed and of course, if you completely automate the process, including the, in, in, the, the issuing of fines, uh, radar speed cameras will actually fund themselves. They'll run at a profit. And so um, that's an example of where a technology used to be uncontrollable, namely driving a car as fast as you like, except in where you can actually see there's a policeman. And suddenly it became very controllable because of the development of another piece of technology. And suddenly, regulation could actually be passed and mean something which it didn't mean before. Um, I have a next question about uh, social technology that you used uh, in your project because it's amazing that for 21,000 pounds you were able to set up a structure with I, I believe like at least thousand people working in so how many all together? Yes. Not at the beginning um, and they were all volunteers of course yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's interesting if you would employ these people, if you pay them and you would try to retain control, that will be like one of the biggest corporation or oh, seriously kind of imp big international oh, corporation yeah, in the world. Yes. It, would, it would have cost an outrageous sum of money, of course, yes. And you have to remember that most of those thousand people were probably working on the project themselves for two or three hours a week at most. So uh, they weren't fully employed on it. They had real jobs. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. And one of the reasons why um, uh, it was possible to get a large number of people involved uh, was because as soon as you mention self-reproducing machine to a journalist, they suddenly get very interested in writing an article about it. And right at the beginning of the project, the, I got the university's um, press department to put out a press release about, uh, about what I intended to do. And lots of big uh, news organizations, New York Times, BBC, uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and so on, uh, all picked up on this and they, they phoned me and interviewed me and they published articles on it. And that was a source of the lot of the volunteers. Um, people simply read newspapers at the time and perhaps even broadcast media were, were rather more influential than they are now. And there wasn't the idea of things going viral online either. Um, so we went through a conventional route to get publicity for it, free publicity, uh, and that produced a large number of volunteers. Of course, these days, you'd be dependent upon the idea going viral and people being recruited as volunteers for that reason. And um, 
things go viral for all sorts of all sorts of uh, causes, as we know that it maybe just it's because it's a picture of a cute kitten, or maybe it's a really interesting idea that nobody's had before. Um, <laughs> those two things seem to be equally interesting to human beings, and so you can't really tell in advance whether your idea is going to go viral or not and get you lots of volunteers. But it's also interesting that the people who are working a couple hours a week, they probably uh, were very useful for the project during this couple hours a week. And as we know from David's bullshit job book, you can employ yeah. thousands of people who will sit there all the time and do nothing, you know, harmful things, you know, yeah. because Absolutely the people right. don't want to do. He's complete, he was completely right about that. Um, yes. And uh, the, the, uh, I'm not saying that all the people on the rep prep project spent their actual working time in bullshit jobs, as, as David would have said. But uh, in fact, many of them had perfectly sensible jobs. So one one of the principal people on the project was a fireman, I, and I think we would all agree that firemen are a fairly essential component of the of the of, of society. Um, uh, and so when he he wasn't uh, with his uh, with his uh, colleagues out on the fire engine, he was uh, he was working on the project. But, uh, yeah. yeah, and so uh, my last question is uh, very personal because so now I um, I kind of realize that all my life I'm moving in between two social setup. One is a very wide group of unknown people. And since I was migrant and I was always traveling and moving from one country to another, I was always exposed to the huge amount of the new groups that I didn't know and I have to make this connection. and the all blogging is like that. You always get comments from the people and engage in conversation with people who you never saw and probably would never see in your life. But at the same time, I'm always working in a very small community of people who I feel um, like affinity group. So if I want actually to do something, this has started to be a close relationship. Often it's my partners or, you know, I was working with my little son. That's how Project Anthropology for Kids were born. So we were doing books together. Mm -hmm. So can you describe yeah. how you were moving in between these two worlds? Because you're talking about working at the university with your students and you're naming some of the people from the projects as the team members. And then uh, mm -hmm. you also engage with this uh, international group and still probably engage, yeah? So, but it's a different relationship, yeah? Yes, it is, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, yes, I mean, there weren't, it wasn't like, it wasn't like the circles of hell with with people in precise locations, you know, <laughs> depending on their sins. Um, it was, it, it, but there were circles that they with sort of with me in the middle, I suppose. Um, uh, there, when the project was, when most of the work was being done on the project, which was in its first three years or so, there were about half a dozen people, plus me, plus my student, who did the vast majority of the work. They got really interested in it, they got really into it, and they devoted a lot of time and they contributed a lot. And and there were then there were people uh, like I've mentioned who developed who just devoted a few hours a week to the project who were, as it were, in the circle around outside them. And they were very much like the two groups you described yourself in, in the activities that you do. Um, and, um, and everybody seemed to sort of know roughly where they were in this system of circles. Um, I mean, there were some people who literally just chipped in one idea on a, a blog post, which turned out to be quite a good idea for the whole project. And that was their sole contribution. They, they'd read a blog and they had an idea and they wrote five sentences and that was it. Um, but nonetheless, they did a useful thing. So uh, whether we consider such people to be part of the project or not, I, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's, you know, anybody can chip in an idea. Um, so yeah, yeah, but you're right. We, we had a small group of people in the center and then people uh, peripheral who did, and of course, the, the more work they did and the more they communicated and so on, the closer they moved to the center. It was as simple as that. Um, we never compiled any statistics on this. It was just a sort of, well, not quite an instinctive thing, but we sort of knew who was who was more or less in the middle and knew who was fur further out and uh, um, perfectly welcome, but not doing so much work well for, for whatever reasons they happen to choose not to do so much. And that was absolutely fine, of course. TG, do you want to ask a question now? 
Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, in my experience in open source, uh, people in open source projects need to come up with community, they find themselves needing to come up with community norms and then uh, as an ongoing thing, educate people in them. So for example, a big famous example is when people say RTFM, you know, read the manual before commenting to codes of conduct are very popular. And there's also in one community I'm in, uh, etiquette guides to, that keep things constructive. Um, yeah. The motivating reason I think is because it's like a marathon and many people do it in their spare time to the extent they have any. Um, and there's different phases in the project when people just sort of, you know, come in from different communities, from different backgrounds. Um, and for the people inside, they find it often easy to get demoralized because, you know, over the years you reflect like, why am I doing this really? You know, mm -hmm. um, after hearing a diatribe, you know, where someone just told you your new idea is just the worst thing in the world. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if there was any significant energy or effort educating people in these community norms? Um, well, the first thing to say is we, we didn't have an etiquette guide. We didn't have publish a list or write a, write a document uh, 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 for any of the things that you mentioned. Um, though uh, 20 minutes ago, when I was talking about disputes arising in the project, um, those are the sorts of occasions when um, such, such things might have come into play. But in fact, because it was one of the one of the interesting things about it was that the, most of the communication was actually done by email. It wasn't done by chat groups. It wasn't done by live video or anything else. Now, an interesting thing about that, of course, is that you don't get instant reactions and you don't get people uh, immediately responding to something in the way, for example, these days they do on Twitter or whatever. Um, I think a consequence of that is that the, all the discussions were more measured than perhaps the more fraught things that tend to happen now, some 16 or 17 years later. Um, and um, so we didn't have norms, we didn't have documents, we didn't have a set of rules, um, except for the rules that define the licensing for the machine itself. Um, which I wrote before we even started, and those remained essentially unchanged to this day. Um, but those were licensing rules for the use of the machine and how it may be distributed and, and under what license it's distributed and so on. Um, they weren't rules for human behavior at all, except in as much as human behavior obviously decides how the machine gets used and distributed. Thank you. Very interesting. Rob, you wanted to ask one more question. I, I, think, I think you've almost just answered my question in the last bit that you were saying there, because the question I wanted to ask was really about intellectual property. So mm -hmm. um, when people became involved in the project, did they ever have to physically actually sign a, a, a contract of any sort, agreeing that any of their intellectual labor would be made freely available to the open source community? And I asked that question because in the background, I. I've, I've been, I know very little about this, but I've been told that within the Linux community, that the, um, the, 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 the person who sort of, as I would put it, invented Linux, he keeps a very firm control over the kernel of the, of the language and things like that. Yes. And Linux, a, yes. a, a lot of the information within the open source community is perhaps not as free as one might think. So, I mean, yeah, it, within your own project, did people have to sort of make a formal commitment to allowing their work to be freely available to others. And did that come up as an issue at all much, Adrian? Uh, no and no. Um, we didn't have any requirement for people to, to sign up to anything in particular, except there was a constraint on them, which was that um, certainly in the beginning, I mentioned we had but one website and that website was covered by a license and anything that appeared on the website was covered by the same license. So as soon as anyone on the project posted anything that they'd done onto the project website, they automatically found themselves under the license which I had chosen before I even took the first uh, electronic component out of a drawer and sold it under a circuit board. Um, so that, that was uh, something, that was the only constraint that people were under. Uh, but of course, if they didn't post what they wanted onto the RetRat website, they could do a bit of RetRat work and, and put the machine out uh, that they developed under a different license. Now, 
if they'd used the technology that we'd already developed, the license which we used, which was the GPL, um, would have constrained them to put any develops they've made of that out under what the GPL calls a compatible license, uh, which obliges people to uh, post any improvements they make under the same set of conditions or uh, compatible set of conditions. Now, uh, we didn't police that. There were occasional arguments about it, um, but um, th there wasn't any practical way that we could actually prevent people from breaking the terms of the license. We certainly didn't have funds to pay for expensive lawyers and all that sort of thing. Um, and I always took the view, um, which was derived from the fact that the machine is self-replicating, which is that, for example, if you do a version of RepRap and then you try and... Uh, um, constrain it by not releasing the designs and not allowing people to copy it, uh, what you've effectively done is to take uh, something that's uh, used to be able to reproduce and you've rendered it sterile. Um, and you're, you've immediately put yourself into a cul-de-sac uh, from which you can't, can't escape unless you choose to change the license back again. Uh, so the machine tended to prosper in we might say Darwinian terms, in terms of the number of copies that got made, um, uh, because the license allowed people to make copies of it. And when people did variants where that wasn't the case, those variants tended to die out. So um, we just, we happened to have Charles Darwin on the side of the license that we'd chosen. That would, perhaps might be the best way to express it. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, to ask you the last question. Um, how much reprap cost now to buy spare parts uh, after these years? It depends, of course, on the spare parts. Um, uh, um, typically, the most expensive single part of the machine is the, is the electronic control board that controls it. And the cheapest ones of those tend to cost about £25, something like that. Um, so that's probably the single most expensive individual component. Um, uh, but there are the, the 25 pound ones aren't so good as the ones that cost 80 pounds, unsurprisingly. Um, and so, you know, the, there's a range of possibilities open there. Um, and because people have developed all sorts of different electronic controllers for the machine, there's a wide range to choose from. Um, the total cost of the machine, um, these days you can get a machine for around about £200 as something like that. Amazing. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, you always was a personal inspira inspiration for me in uh, with our project Museum of Care. So I, I, I'm just orienting on what you did, trying to to kind of model and model our activity for what happens with RepRap. Although you had a problem that the RepRap was not software, but hardware. Mm. And uh, we are, you know, not even hardware, not a software, where like this content production relationship uh, project that is even more confusing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I, I, one, of, one of the advantages that a piece of engineering hardware has is that in one sense, you, you can't argue with it. It, it. There it is, it's a physical thing. Um, uh, here I am sitting in my dining room and I can reach across and I can pick up a table mat. That, that's a thing. You can't argue with the fact that it's a table mat. It's a table mat. Um, and so um, at least with a piece of engineering, everybody knows what it is when they see it, if you see what I mean. So you, 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 you've got that constraint put on you by the physical universe, which is not nearly so much of a constraint uh, the less hardware-y the thing you're doing is. Yes? Sure thing, sure thing. Uh, so Adrian, I had a very similar question to Nika around um, RepRap and like how you can get started with it. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, I think last time you were with us, you mentioned that polylactic acid, which is the, uh, the raw material from which you make the- it's One of the raw materials, the main one that's most commonly used, yes. Yes. Uh, so I think I, I know you mentioned that you can make it with uh, potato starch or food, for example. So it's it's uh, you can make it at home, basically. Uh, yeah. Is there any place you could recommend us to maybe like where we can learn more about how to make that? Uh, I've been trying to dig into it and I 
kind of struggle really <laughs> to, uh, to yes, it, it, I have to say it, it's something we did once uh, on the project and it was it was easy enough to do in the sense that if you if you know a bit of chemistry and you you you, you follow the rules you end up with a, a product but um, it was a bit like it, suppose you were to sit down, uh, sorry, not sit down, suppose you were to stand up in your kitchen and decide to make a cake. Um, you go to the cupboard and you get a bag of flour. What you wouldn't do is go to the cupboard and get a bag of wheat and start grinding it. Now, um, <laughs> the making your own polylactic acid is a bit like starting to make a cake with grains of wheat and, having, and starting to grind them. It, it, it is tedious to do, I have to say. Now, which is not to say it can't be done, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky. Um, there are another couple of points I need to make. One is that there's a, very, um, uh, there's a very critical stage, which is where you have to get the lactic acid that you've made by fermentation. You have to get it very, very dry indeed. Uh, you, can't, you can't just dry it using normal me methods. You have, to, you have to get it less, I think, six parts per million of water by weight. Um, and and you, can, you can do that by passing very dry air over it, which you dry by passing the air through calcium, calcium chloride to dry it. Um, the other thing is that you need a catalyst, uh, which is called tin octoate. Um, and you mix that in with the lactic acid and then you heat it and the lactic acid polymerizes around the catalyst. And something you've got to be very, very careful of is that tin octoate is toxic. Um, the amount that you end up with in the plastic you've made is very, very small. In fact, it's so small that polylactic acid is licensed for surgery. People make sutures out of it to, um, to stitch people up inside because your body will then dissolve the sutures. Um, and your body is capable of dealing with that tiny, tiny quantity of tin. But of course, in order to get the catalyst in when you start, um, you have to have it in concentrated form. And that is actually not dangerous if you're used to dealing with chemicals, but it is something to be cautious of. Let me put it that way. Interesting. Um... So, Adrian, thank you so much for coming. That was amazing. We will uh, upload it uh, on YouTube and then send a link. Please do. And, yeah. yeah. OK, so we, we hope to see you <laughs> sometime again. I hope to see you, all of you as well. Uh, yes, I, I'll go now because I'm going to go and have some lunch. So um, thank you very much for inviting me along again. And uh, I shall see you all soon, I'm sure. OK. OK, bye bye.